Well, I really enjoyed the film and I was wondering, was it always your plan to make another film? Uh, another Jack in the Box film? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So this this was our third in the series. Uh, when we made the first film, you never quite know how you know people are going to receive it, whether people will like it or, or hate it. But we were we were grateful that people liked it. So, yeah, the intention was to kind of always expand on the lore a little bit and kind of play with, you know, the capabilities of, of the Jack character and, and see how far we could take it. And the beginning of the movie was more about um, solving a mystery and finding secrets and clues. So I was wondering, can you explain what made you choose the first half to be a bit more of a mystery kind of secret exploring the place? Yeah, sure. So I think it comes from kind of wanting to try and freshen it up a little bit. Obviously, this was the third in the series. So we've done, you know, them just finding the box and then opening the box quite early in the story. And we wanted to try and do something with this one. There was a little bit, like you said, a bit more mystery, a little bit more of a discovery, a little bit more backstory about Raven, who the protagonist is, and just add a kind of new dimension to, to the story. And I think it also, you know, the, the, the third film plays with the idea that the box was never meant to be found again. So it was kind of logical that the kind of first 15 or so minutes of the film should be following someone trying to, you know, unearth the secrets and bring the Jack back to the world, even though he was never supposed to be once again. Yeah, I kind of like that style. And I also liked how the flashback scenes were in black and white. So can you share the creative decision to make it black and white? So with black and white, it's something we've done with uh, some of our other films too. It does help uh, sometimes help the audience kind of differentiate between uh, current, obviously current uh, things happening in the film and things that happened in flashbacks. And I just think everybody kind of loves the black and white kind of aesthetic of film. It's such a classic look and it's such a shame that's all kind of moved away really. Everything is obviously colour based and that's just yeah. the way that it is. Any chance we can kind of go back to the old ways is always fun and it's just such a kind of classical look to, to black and white. And how did you find the locations for the film and was any of the locations a set or was it all real places? So yeah, so the, the sets were all real. Uh, we've done a combination of kind of real locations and sets before and I think, in my opinion, unless the set is of extremely high quality, you can always kind of feel the the imperfections in it it doesn't quite stand up to some of these buildings that are you know quite literally worth mm -hmm. tens of millions of pounds so you know it, that's very difficult to replicate with the set one of the challenges obviously is if you've got a lot of blood in your film which we do some of these buildings well all of these buildings don't let you do blood in them so that's <laughs> a very tricky situation which is why you'll often see us move people to barns or other you know places that are not quite as fancy so we can go a bit crazy with blood but the, the backstory with this main location, which was Fonmon Castle in South Wales, uh, the main thing was it was where my wife and I got married. Uh, go. So she always hates that I say this, but I spent most of our wedding day picturing a, a clown running through the hallways. So uh, always imagining what a film would be like to film there. So, uh, yeah, it was it was nice to finally make that happen all these years later. So that was 2019 I got married. So Did five years later. That? Did it bring back memories from your wedding? Yeah, yeah, it was very strange having a killer clown kind of rampage down the <laughs> aisle when I got married. That was a bit unusual. But um, yeah, it's a great location. Every room you go in has spectacular things to look at and touches that, you know, like I said before, you can't really replicate with a set unless you spend huge amounts of money. So it's a great location. And were you allowed to explore the whole castle and did anyone get lost? Did anyone get lost? Uh, yeah, so the castle, it's not the biggest castle you'll ever, you'll ever see. Uh, no one, as far as I'm aware, got lost. <laughs> but um, no, it, it's, it's fairly small. And I think we used pretty much every single room it had to offer at some stage or another. But uh, no, it's a great location. And what was the casting process like? And how did you find your lead characters, actors? So the cast situation is kind of a combination of uh, we've either worked with them before or we put casting calls out online and, you know, we talk a little bit about the story and just try and get a sense of people that are interested in, and available, obviously, on the dates. The hard thing being in South Wales, in, in Britain, is that, you know, a lot of these films, 
the market really wants American leads, and that's understandable. They're quite hard to find. So we do, you know, quite an exhaustive process to either find an authentic American actor or someone that can do a fantastic American accent. So that's part of our challenge. And how did you come up with the look for the Jack in the Box? And did any of the cast or crew get scared? Well, on set. No, because uh, on set, it's actually quite uh, an unscary process, really. You know, with guy Nicholas, uh, Nicholas and Scombe in the costume of playing the Jack. He's a very friendly guy and uh, he wouldn't be scaring anybody. He's very, very friendly. And, you know, it's, it's a guy in a suit at the end of the day when it's not lit correctly, when it's not kind of in the context of the story, doesn't quite have the same effect. <laughs> How long would it take for the costume and makeup for the Jack in the Box? So it's actually quite a quick process with Jack. We, we've done a previous film before called The Ghost Within, where it was a process of about a five hour application for that character. All these different facial parts, um, body pain, nails, etc. With Jack, actually, it's essentially a one-piece mask that goes on very quickly. And the great thing about that is we can get filming a lot quicker. The days with the actor, obviously, we can get a lot more out of the days in terms of you know what we can shoot, and we're not spending you know five hours application, three hours taking you know the, the thing off. So it's a really good process. With an hour, he's good to go. So that's really helpful. That's good. And how did you come up with the other characters' outfits and school uniforms and shoes for the film? Uh, so just through research, trying to find costumes that, um, you know, we liked different examples from kind of popular teenage films that have escaped my mind right now. Um, which is a bit <laughs> But, you know, kind of the famous classic kind of American uh, story where you've got this kind of, uh, we like the kind of waistcoat look and the navy was just something we really liked and they were all you know basically custom built for the film so yeah that was something important of course is, is that when you're making a horror film like this where a lot basically most of the cast are going to get killed in some way but you've got lots of lots of costumes at different stages of where some you can get covered in blood and then because we shoot out of order you know you kill someone one day and then the next day they're back to day one so you need to go back in the kind of in the in the wardrobe department and find the original kind of like you know the, the clean costumes and stuff so uh, that's part of the challenge i like the costumes and did you allow the cast to do much improvisation or was it more stick to the script um, i'm always quite flexible with, with, with improvisation so what i always say to cast is that you know i'm obviously trying to jump into the heads of, of teenage girls which I, i'm not one surprisingly so uh you know if, if i talk to them and say look this is kind of the, the meaning of the scene this is what I'm trying to achieve in terms of you know the story beats if there's something that a character says that doesn't quite ring off your tongue correctly if there's something that you think Lawrence could I say this instead but has the same impact the same meaning I'm always happy to discuss and and change but I've got to be honest I think 97 percent of what you hear is from the script that's cool did you allow the cast to do their own stunts? And during a scene where one of the actors is chained up, were they actually chained up or could they get out easily? Yeah, so this is the really careful thing you've got to be with with these films is that safety is priority. And, mm -hmm. you know, whenever we do chains, for example, they may look metal on the screen, but they're very, very uh, flimsy plastic. So, yes, she was chained up for real in terms of, you know, she was attached to the, to the beams, but... You know, we got. You'd actually have to be careful in many ways. If you just kind of moved her arm, they'd break. So you have to be very careful. You know, they're not real. They're not metal. And everything we we do and make is is with safety in mind. So it's actually quite difficult to to pull that off to make it look realistic, make it look like metal. But actually, it's very very plastic. <laughs> <laughs> what scene did you find the most hardest or challenging to film? Good question. We filmed, well, we shot this, uh, we started filming this a year ago yesterday, so it feels a long time ago. <laughs> I think because of the nature of the, the film, there was a lot, it's like an ensemble cast. It was my first ever ensemble film. We often had even sometimes simple dialogue scenes with seven characters in, the, in a room. And what people perhaps don't realise is, is obviously you've always got a ticking clock against you. So if a character moves and says something, then moves to this part of the room, 
I've got to get enough cover coverage. I've got to get enough camera angles to see everybody, what everybody's saying, what everybody's doing, what everybody's reacting to as well. And then if someone, let's say, for example, slams down a book in the scene I'm thinking of, I need a close-up of the book too. So before you know it, you've got this scene, which on paper seems quite simple. It's people talking. It's it's an enormous task, you know, with, you know, so many different shots. So actually, I think some of the some of the more simple dialogue looking shots uh, scenes in the film are some of the hardest when you've got upwards of six, seven cast. That's interesting. And do you have a funny memory from set or can you share any deleted scenes? Deleted scenes? I don't think we had any deleted scenes. I think we used virtually every single scene from the film. Funny stories. Do you know what? I'm going to sound really boring. I cannot think of any. This was this was a year. So sorry, I can't think of any more now. <laughs> but um, no, no, just lots of clown around, oh, just, oh. and lots of lots of clown stuff, lots of long hours, long days, and uh, yeah, people passionate about bringing that clown to life. <laughs> and what did you use for blood on set? Uh, so on blood, blood we we use I, I don't know the exact term for it, but it's essentially bought blood. Uh, it's not made. It's it's you know from a a shop that that sells very authentic looking blood. And the difficult thing with blood is to get the right consistency, the right color, and that's very very difficult. And the stuff we use comes in big kind of containers. It's very very expensive, but it looks incredibly authentic. Do you, uh, you and the rest of the cast keep in touch now? Yeah, we've got a WhatsApp group, um, which, which is nice. Uh, we always like to keep uh, each other updated with what's going on. The film has just had quite a big release in South America, so it's been really exciting to see it, people kind of enjoying the film and all the, the cosplays in South America. So we've kind of been sharing those with each other on WhatsApp, and that's been really, really fun, especially as one of the cast was out there at the time really interesting to discuss but um yeah i guess a whatsapp group and yeah we're going to work with uh, leona clark who played olivia in the film we're going to work with her again in our upcoming film uh in a couple of weeks that's cool um and do you plan on making another jack in the box film or even feature with one with raven returning because we didn't fully see what happened to her at the end possibly never say never i think there is there is um the chance that we will i think the the story doesn't feel like it's had its conclusion i think there is room for for a conclusion and it's a difficult one because you know if, if, if it takes us roughly a year to make a film and with so many different ideas and different things we'd like to do you know the, the, the time is short so it's, it's picking and choosing what those projects are but i i would be a little bit surprised if in a year or two or less we do discuss a fourth outing for Jack. And I would have fingers crossed. And do you have any upcoming projects you can share or the film you're working on with the other cast member from this film? Yes. So we're, we're in pre-production, heavy pre-production at the moment for a film called The Companion, which is a sci-fi horror, which I'm really excited about. It essentially tells the story of um, an older man who is a widow, lives in a, a manor all by himself, and is really missing the companionship of his son that died as a young boy. So he re recreates himself this, this kind of replica child using his history of kind of robotics and expertise. And things take a bit of a dark turn with this <laughs> companion. Um, that sounds exciting. And my final question before I go is, if you had three wishes, what would they be? And would you ever be tempted to use a jack in a box to grant you wishes? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I wouldn't, because that would mean a lot of people have to die, which would be a bit a bit unfair for those people. Uh, so I wouldn't, but what would my three wishes be? My three wishes would be, um, God, I would love, I would love the whole world to love and see our films. That would be fantastic. Um, I would love for my cats to live forever. <laughs> and third wish to be a scratch handicap golfer. That's always been my goal. 
and it always seems so far away. <laughs> Do you like golfing? Yeah, a bit too much. Yeah, <laughs> love. It. Very addictive, like filmmaking, but really, really hard. Well, thank you for doing this interview. I hope you have a good day. Yeah, well, thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed chatting with you, and I hope lots of people see the film. Thanks, Daniel. And nice chatting to you too. Good luck with your future projects as well. Thank you. All the best. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Diary, the diary of the man who captured it, chronicles how he enslaved the Yakas Tamara in this box forever. You want me to go and steal the box? First, Raven, I need you to find it. This is all because of you. I didn't mean for any of this. What is that thing, Raven? <laughs>